Okay, I think it is recording. All right, so this is Maha Bailey from the American University in Cairo, and we are doing a demo of Conversation Cafe, which is a liberating structure. Um, and again, I'm, I'm going to use it for the concept of community building in the class. Um, and what I like about liberating structures is generally that they're equitable conversations, but Conversation Cafe specifically is about giving everyone an equal opportunity to speak. Um, within, you know, within bounds, obviously. One of the things that's important when you're doing Conversation Cafe um, is if you want students to be taking notes, then you need to give them a link either to slides or to a Google Doc or something where they can put in their notes. For this one, I'm using um, a link to these slides and I'm going to put it in the chat for participants and then I'll have a separate page for each group and I'll, I'll show it to you in a minute. Uh, so it's a liberating structure. Again, because you're going to use breakout rooms, you need to give people uh, a warning that you know if something goes wrong and they find themselves alone they can just leave the breakout room come back if they disconnect you'll the host has to take them back into their rooms if someone has a very bad internet connection sometimes as a host i just keep them in the main room because the moving between rooms uh, makes them disconnect more than usual um, and again letting people know what they need to do if they need help asking for help uh, from the zoom button if you're using zoom so the idea here of a conversation cafe is that it engages everyone in making sense of profound challenges and you split people up into groups of four or five to have these conversations. And the topic for today is what would make a video call enjoyable to you? And so people could either reflect on video calls they have done before or they have seen before or they would aspire to. They can take whatever angle they like on it. And we're saying groups of four or five people, you're going to need in each of the breakout rooms, one person to volunteer to be the host. Um, and the host doesn't really need to do anything except just take notes maybe and, and take time because the time is very important. And you can use something like a pencil or a pen uh, as a virtual talking object to make sure that you pass it on to the next person, but you don't have to do that. Some people find that corny. Some people like it, it's up to you. Um, and so just before you go uh, to those, um, we'll explain the sequence of steps and just we need to all agree to suspend judgment on what other people are saying, respect one another, Try to understand another person rather than focus on persuasion. And that's so different than debating, right? This is the opposite of debate. Um, mm -hmm. You want to invite and honor mm -hmm. diverse opinions. You want to speak uh, what has personal heart and meaning rather than intellectualize things. So we want people to speak from the heart, right? And to go for honesty and depth without going on and on and on. And that's one of the really important things here is it being concise. So it's in four rounds. Um, the first round, each person shares what he or she is thinking about a topic in like one minute. So because there are four of us, we're going to take four minutes to do this. The second round is each person shares thoughts and feelings after having listened to everybody at the table and sort of responds after they've listened to everyone. So this also makes sure that students are listening to each other. And then the third round, you can give this a little more time. I've given it here. I've given it four to five minutes, but you can give it like 10 minutes if you want of open conversation where you don't have to time yourself one minute each. This one's gonna be really interesting to watch what happens here as we do this one, by the way. Uh, we'll reflect on it after we're done. And then the last round, each person takes a minute to share their takeaways from the conversation. All right, now everyone can take notes if they wanted to, but it's, it's easier with, um, when you're sharing things like Google Slides to have one person per, per group editing, because if too many people are editing at the same time, uh, it goes a bit wonky. You can also give them different documents to take notes on if you like, you know, different groups to take notes in different places, you can do that too. Whatever, whatever you feel makes sense to you. Um, and so that's the, it's just the, and then I have a different uh, slides for each of the breakout rooms, breakout room one, breakout room two, and I ask the team members to write their names and then start taking in the notes. All right, so for now, I'm just gonna keep this up. Remember the prompt is what would make a video call enjoyable to you? Uh, and then we send people out into breakout rooms and they start having the conversation. Can you agree to be the timekeeper, right? Yes. Okay, I think we can stop sharing. It's just like four minutes, four minutes, four minutes, four minutes. Should be easy to, to follow that. Mm -hmm. Okay, who wants to go first? And then, um, Ken, can you also take notes or will that be difficult to do both at the same time? Maybe someone uh, else can take notes. Maybe someone else can. I can not take Mia. notes. I'll take notes. <laughs> I'll take notes. Yeah, not Mia, because she's on the phone. So that's another thing to keep in mind again, if someone's on the phone. I'm glad that we have someone on the phone for this one, because that'll happen with students yeah. as well, right? Okay, yep. so I'll take notes, uh, but everyone has access to the notes. <coughs> I'll share my screen as I take notes. How's that? Okay. 
That's a good idea. Right? Yeah. That's fun. Okay. That's so good. let's get started. Okay. You want to start, Autumn or Mia? I can uh, go first and start. Go, Mia. Oh, go ahead, Autumn. Okay. Um, so what makes a video call enjoyable? The first thing that came to mind is a story. I always like to receive stories. Um, and those stories could be sometimes personal, but they could also just be things, just stories that embed a certain kind of wisdom that I remember. So that's the first thing that came to mind. Um, also, I love to see people's, um, you know, pets or, or things um, in their home or, or even children or family members that peek in to wave. All of that makes a video call more enjoyable to me. Cool. That was about 40 seconds. That's uh, okay. We won't force uh, Mia. You got any other thoughts to add to that before um, I switch to Autumn? A one final thought, which is um, I also um, get a lot out of a video call if um, there's something that I take away from it. Like when I have a kind of clear sense of something I've learned within that call. Okay. Wonderful. And you're, Autumn, you're ready? Yeah. Um, so maybe this sounds, I don't know, this might sound kind of selfish, but um, I think one of the main things that make it that I enjoy a call is that I like the other people in the call. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which can be tricky, I guess, in a classroom, but I think that goes back to like the whole idea of building um, instructor presence as well as a social presence inside your class. And so um, that's a big one for me. Also, um, small. Um, and so even if it's a big, if it is a big group, then having uh, the ability to do some breakout groups or something, just because I feel like with a larger group, it's harder for me to listen to diverse voices with a larger group. Um, it's a lot of times it's one person or just one or two people kind of pushing out information. It's not very interactive. It's not very collaborative. So smaller groups, I think, lend themselves a little bit more to a space where I can talk as well as listen um, that can be a little bit more participatory. So. Good, good. I'll jump in then. So kind of bridging off what Autumn said, I. Liking other people in the call is important, but I like to have a mix of people I already know and then people mm -hmm. I don't. And I'm really bridging off virtually connecting, obviously, here. Um, and even if it's the people I don't know, I'd like to kind of know about them before we have the call, um, which we often do as well in a virtually connecting session where I can kind of investigate them a little bit and think about it. And um, Although I, I love kits and families and stuff, um, obviously it gets really distracting like I was earlier when it gets too noisy um, with those people that have the open mics and um, letting people know about how their environment can affect the, um, the ambience for the other people in the call. So you gotta be aware of what your noise levels are and stuff like that. So that'll be about my minute. And then I'll take notes for you Maha now as you get your minute. Ah, thank you, Ken. Um, so for me, what I look for in, in, in Zoom calls is intimacy and a call that is not stressful. So intimacy, I think, is a little bit of what Autumn was talking about in terms of small people. Your typing is almost as loud as my typing, Ken. Um, so I usually <laughs> mute myself when I'm typing because people tell me I type because I, I learned to type when I type hard. Anyway, no time. Um, so the intimacy in small groups. And then the other thing is for it not to be stressful. Um, sometimes that relates to who the people are in the call. If they're people I like, if there are few, this makes it less stressful for me. Um, but also if I'm in a situation where I feel like I have a choice of how I participate, whether I want to participate orally or just in chat or just stay quiet, uh, which is kind of counter to what we're doing right now. Because right now it sort of requires everyone to participate. Um, uh, but if I know ahead of time that that's what's expected, then I'll choose whether to go or not to go. If I don't know that I'm expected to like turn my camera on, sometimes I'm not dressed or ready for it, so. Yeah. Cool, that was about time for that round. I think I got your notes there. So that's the end of round one. We'll let and now <laughs> we can do round two where we um, 
uh, go, basically we do the same thing, but now we're reflecting on what each other have said. Now we have the benefit of what everybody else has said, right? Right, and probably more open, not necessarily one minute, one minute, one minute. I well, think that's so you still need hot. four minutes. You, you need okay. four minutes to respond. I can time the four minutes, but I think it wasn't necessarily yeah. okay. uh, one minute each type of thing. All right. Okay, I'm putting a it timer on for four okay. minutes. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, you were saying, Autumn? Uh, I was just saying that, uh, yeah, I can go first this time. That's fine. Sure. Um, I, I really agreed with everything that everybody said. I feel like all <laughs> of those things, <laughs> there wasn't anything I was like, oh, you know, that actually would make for a horrible call for me. Um, I think Matt have really hit the nail on the head with the intimacy piece. I think you're right. I think that's exactly what I was trying to get at with the small, right? It's the ability to actually feel like when I speak, I'm being listened to and that I'm listening to somebody else, right? There's a reciprocal there's a reciprocatory, reciprocation <laughs> kind of thing that is, uh, there's a potential for with those smaller groups that I think the, the bigger ones we don't necessarily get to. And even, um, you know, what, what you were saying, Ken, about the mix of people that you know and that you don't know, sometimes it can get boring if it's just people that you know all the time, like bringing in new people um, always makes things really interesting as well. And your thoughts, Maha, or Mia? Mia's walking, so. Yeah, Mia's just getting home. Um, I, I was thinking again about this um, mix of people you know and you don't know because I'm the kind of person who gets energized by meeting new people. But I also mm -hmm. really like my friends. <laughs> I like spending time with them. So I, I also like that mix. It wouldn't have been what I would have said, but when Ken said it, it resonated. Um, I'm just thinking about all of this and, and trying to think about uh, what it would mean for our classes because our students don't get to choose to be or not to be in our class. <laughs> so how do you create a classroom space that meets, like they not all, have the same like we're agreeing with each other on a lot of things because we're people who spend a lot of time together on video calls <laughs> so we've sort of decided how we want our video calls together to be and we make them like that um, um, we chose to be here. and we chose to be here but students are not necessarily like that so i think it's like thinking about doing this kind of activity with students and seeing so there's what choice there mm -hmm. to bridge off that maha is is how do we make those breakout groups right sometimes and i've had this conversation where they want to have the same breakout groups for you know each day so they get to know the people longer or it's their project group whereas sometimes i like to kind of motivate them to have random groups where they're going to get to know someone so mm -hmm. i think there's that kind of thought of how we do these breakout groups and it's important for the students and we should listen to their thoughts on that as well as we're watching Mia walk around, giving her time oh, to is Mia join ready into to the conversation. Is Mia ready to contribute or not? I so know. I lost the signal for a little bit when I came into the house in terms of the audio. I couldn't hear what you guys just shared out. Um, so maybe- uh, you, can, you can reflect on the first round. Okay. Yeah, that's what we're doing really. Yeah. Oh, we're reflecting. Okay. Yeah. So um, it was interesting to me. There was an, a lot of emphasis on um, questions or, or values of intimacy and establishing intimacy. Um, and, you know, for some, that might be things that are distracting. But for others, like, like pets or children or that kind of thing. But for right. others, I think it's, it's more about... Um, you know, signals that you're getting, that you're being listened to, and that the conversation is getting deeper um, and getting more engaged and more, you're feeling a sense of connect connection and connectivity growing within the context of the call. So, um, you know, that's what I was sort of, I found myself reflecting on is like, how do we determine the difference between like things that are distracting, but also sort of human, and then, how, and then the depth of conversation. And those are two different kind of threads within establishing what, in my mind, is a good call, a real call. Wonderful. So that was about the four minute timer on round two. 
And do you want to mm -hmm. so jump around? The open round three is open. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I stopped taking notes. So just keeping in mind that maybe students want to switch who's taking notes between rounds. Because like well, as soon as Ken started taking notes, I just stopped. Um, well, we have the advantage now that we're recording. We don't need to take notes. So that's a good point. You can also ask students to record, like give one of the students co-host access and let them record, by the way, if they want. Right. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna, can I kick off the, the mm -hmm. open conversation? Let me have another timer. Yes, so there okay. are two things here uh, that I wanted to comment on. First of all, this whole random groups versus being in a group by choice that Ken brought up. And I've been thinking about this a lot recently that I think it's useful at the beginning of a semester to put people in random groups for a lot of in-class group work that is low stakes, mm -hmm. not a very high grade. But then when they're responsible for a, like a 5, 10, 20% project or something, I feel like they need to have some choice in who they get to work with so that they, um, so they don't feel like, you know, they, they just got a short end of the stick by ending up with someone, you know, like I feel like they should have the agency of choosing so that they can take responsibility. But that's, that's a separate thing from video calls. <laughs> so I, that's right. maybe a different conversation that we need to have. It's probably a universal conversation that people have different um, disagreements on. Um, right. But in video calls, I'm just thinking that also the, the impact on different people who have like anxiety or, or are on the autism spectrum or whatever, that, that what, like the word, a word like intimacy might be frightening for someone. Like yes. maybe someone's listening to me like, oh, like nah, I don't want that intimacy with strangers or I don't want intimacy online. Like I wanna be face to face yeah. with that person, but if I'm not face to face, I don't wanna develop intimacy with a machine or, you know? I was just thinking about that and the thing about trust, which I think were we, talk, we were talking about this in another video, um, but that trust is something that takes time to build, but sometimes to be able to do these activities um, comfortably, it requires some amount of giving trust before the others have earned it. And again, that's not something that all people are comfortable with. And so it's really important right. to sort of give people leeway to to give or offer as much of themselves as they feel comfortable and not feel like they have to overshare if someone else is oversharing because that can be false, kind of contagious as well. Well, I shouldn't mm -hmm. say contagious during a pandemic. That's fine. I, I was thinking when, when Mia turned off her phone and the other activity, um, whether we, there's affordances we can make where if we all turned off our phone and we were just listening to each other whether that would change the way we're having this conversation or any of our conversations and maybe think about that and then there might be that you mean mute and comfortable. Mute, you mean mute and turn off the video no just turn off all our cameras right now and then, then we don't have this cameras. visual stimulus and some people might feel more comfortable that way and then some of us might become a little more empathetic for them being comfortable that way because we're well, all so used to doing this kind of conversation every day, Maha. And yeah, true. A, That's yeah. true. We're not your typical people, but but I'm screen sharing, so I can't see any of you. I've closed. I'm screen sharing right. and I've closed the, the video, but I could turn it on. Like right now, I'm seeing you, but before that, I wasn't. Right. So I, I was just thinking, driving off that, what we saw, where Mia, you know, turned off her video. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, I see some people Troika. do that. I see some people do that. Like that's. So you talk about like passing a an object. And I think that's mm -hmm. fun, but yeah, some people we think forgot it's to pass the object. But it's it's some <laughs> it's just like another way of doing that, right? If my camera is on, then I'm talking. Then I have the talking object. The object mm -hmm. is my video in a way, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and so then when I stop talking and I kind of turn it over, I signal that by turning off my camera. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's kind of like what we used to do with virtually connecting. When you unmute, it means you want to talk. And, right. and what was we, happening and there is that. if someone, yeah, and if someone unmutes by mistake, you think, hey, you unmuted. Do you want to say something? They're like, no, I'm unmuted by mistake. When they're not part of the protocol. I've done that in my classes. I've done that in my classes. That people want to speak. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Then maybe that's something you establish that norm so that people know what it means. You know, how do you signal? Because online, because of lags as well. Uh, people tend to by mistake talk over each other uh, yeah. and and then you don't have the like the visual signals are sometimes not very smooth so you're not yes. seeing that that person has finished talking which is why the one minute thing helps is like you know you're going to give them their minutes you're not going to interrupt them before the minute and they're not going to you know worry that someone's going to stop them for their minutes. great point so let's let's move on to takeaways we've got about four minutes to do a takeaway 
Who wants to start that from this conversation? So a big takeaway for me is um, getting back to some of the, you know, just kind of realizing that, like, the perceptions that I have of what other people are presenting might not actually be, you know, the reality. So, like, seeing somebody um, unmute their camera or somebody do something like that, there could be a lag. And maybe I'm not saying it at the same time that they actually did it, right? Um, or maybe somebody's looking off camera like this, and I think they're not paying attention, but in reality, they have a second monitor, and they're totally watching everything that's yep. going on, right? So that, that, um, the, the thing that I'm seeing and the experience that I'm having to not be too judgmental and to kind of give people the benefit of the doubt because, um, yeah, sometimes mm. there's – other stuff going on and to, you know if somebody doesn't have their camera on maybe it's because they don't have a camera <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i i was thinking a lot about how and, and i struggle with this because we're all we do this all the time when we're talking online and and i've been working in industry and software since the 90s doing stuff online so i have a real struggle understanding that my students aren't used to doing these discussions online and they have a different view of what it is to work in person versus online and i'm probably more comfortable doing this this way than being inside a physical room with people um, and i think i need to work on my empathy and i don't know modeling working on ways of helping our students learn how to do this um, uh, and I'm still trying to figure out how to do that because I've only been really teaching online since October. People keep coming to me as an expert and I'm like, hey, I'm not the expert. I can point you to other people that are, but how do we share how we do this well and how do we get better at this? You're still um, more comfortable than the regular person. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. the other teachers are, are even in a worse situation than you and they're, need to help, they're needing to help their students. Go ahead, Mia, sorry I interrupted you. Oh, no, it's okay. I was actually just going to pick up on the word empathy um, that I think can so appropriately like foregrounded. Um, it's basically what Autumn said, too. But I think in real life teaching, um, we have established a kind of understanding of what empathy might, um, you know, how to extend ourselves in empathetic ways. But there's like extra challenges that we experience when we want to sort mm. of both model and also signal that we are empathetic in online contexts. And I um, remember having a recent video call where I realized that my eagerness to signal that I'm empathetic, that I'm listening and that I understand that I don't understand everything, but that, you know, in the context of each learner, that at the same time, I'm interested and I care, that that, um, to, to, to get that across uh, through the screen or through, um, you know, a screen interaction, whether it be with camera or not, is, is really challenging and draining. Um, and so I'm constantly thinking about how to do that better, but also how to take care of myself so that I don't sort of have an empty tank the whole time. But that is an important realization for me is that that seems to be a value that I'm trying to push forward in front of my students a lot is like I'm caring, but how do I signal that caring um, visually, but also through exercises and conversations, through language, through it all, you know, through all the ways we have tools in an online learning context. Do we have time, Ken, for just a very quick one? Oh, yeah. Um, okay. Well, we hit the four minutes on this thing, but... Um, okay, I'll just take a very quick minute uh, as part of the conversation cafe and then... Yeah, but if, it, if we were in real in a real conversation cafe, we'd be back in the main room now and stuff yep. like that. But I, I was going to say two things. First of all, I think this thing that Ken was saying about students not being used to this, I think it's a good life skill for them because probably in their careers, they will need to do this yes. very soon. I think the world, everyone's working this way now. And so they will probably need to work this way. They were going to anyway, but now really, they're really going to need to do yeah. it when they graduate. Um, and the other thing I was thinking about is I, I want to just remind people to take a look at the safety considerations that Kate Bowles uh, wrote uh, for this group of community building resources. Um, maybe I should put the link to that also with the YouTube of this video. 
uh, mm -hmm. probably with every video, I think people should look at it as they think right. about every one of these things to think about how they can, um, you know, just make sure that they're sensitive to different students' needs without canceling out an activity that maybe 80% of the students are going to love. Yeah. But just making sure that the 20% who are not going to love it don't get harmed by it. So right. this, is, this is it for Conversation Cafe. I'm going to stop sharing. Does anybody okay. want to reflect on the process real quick? Like maybe just take five minutes to, to debrief on that. Um, it's hard that the one minute kind of back and forth was really, it seemed too quick, but it's, you know, we've got to be cognizant of time. Um, that was my main thing, but yeah, I like the different structure of each of the portions, although it kind of blended like round two and round three kind of just blended together, right? Where we were sharing thoughts and feelings about what we listened to and then open conversation, but maybe that's on purpose. I think it's because you can, as the host, didn't do your job properly. <laughs> Probably. In the second round, you were like, yeah. oh, well, we don't have to stick to the minute. I'm like, no, you do have to stick to the minute. <laughs> oh, I, I, it's because I thought that's what you said. So it was my That's round three. That's round three. Okay. So that's right. why they, they blended into each other. But it's all right. I mean, nothing bad happened. No. I think, I think what ends up happening is because the first round is all about each person taking a minute, you automatically tend to notice if someone hasn't spoken. And so maybe yeah. not everyone takes a minute in the third round, but every but we all notice if someone hasn't spoken and things like that. I think we kind of did. Sort of, yeah. So I think I it's think sort it of also got thrown fine. off a little bit because um, Mia was uh, Mia kind of froze up a little bit, and I she I think it was technically like if we would have done the same order that we did the first time. Yeah, that that would have reinforced networks. it, yeah. but she you was, it was kind either. of clear that you don't have to, but I do think that helps. I think it helps if you do the same order that you did the first time. And Ken kind of called mm -hmm. on me too. And so I, I kind of felt like I yeah. had the ball and I could mm -hmm. tell that Mia was kind of in between and then she was kind of breaking up. So I didn't want to say, no, it's Mia's turn. And then she would have. Yeah. So I, I mean, she I texted us that she was just pulling oh, up to the house, right. which people yeah. watching don't know about, but we noticed. And I think that's why yeah. Ken called on you because I, yeah. it would have been a good time for her. We assume. But I think I think if you do between round one and round two, you, you keep the same order. You don't yeah. have to, but I think if you can, that that kind idea. of then puts this uh, separation between two and three in a it more stark way. Yeah, I guess there's also the fact that I think Ken was the one who was deciding who goes next, or I wrote the names of the people in the notes, or like, like who decides yeah. who goes next yeah. is, is a thing that could be sensitive for some students. Sure. And so I guess we should let them know, I guess. Ahead of time. You know, they can like we do in Virtually Connecting, where we tell, okay, you're, you're going to be up next. Wants to go next, yeah, so you type it in the chat and that helps a little bit. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. And I think for the facilitator, the host of this thing, is to send students every four minutes that it's time to switch. So not yeah. every minute, but every four minutes. So that helps the timekeeper as well a little bit. Yeah, a little bit of flexibility in there. And someone might only the use other, 40 seconds. The other thing I feel like is that maybe this is, because this it's, it strikes me that this exercise is somewhat complex. And mm -hmm. so this might be something that I do with a group not, that is a little bit more established with one another. It's not a and, first timer. It's not, I don't know if it's an, if it's a first time or like, let's get everybody together and get folks to know one another. I feel like this is once they, so one of the first things that you ask people to do is uh, somebody needs to kind of identify themselves as like a leader in the room to be a host for that particular room. And if, if they're brand new to working with one <laughs> another, I don't know if they have kind of established like those kind of roles. So I think if they right. if they know each other a little bit more and if they've done a couple rounds of other things, that maybe that gets that that part becomes easier. And if that part's easier, I think that the whole thing would more, be more clear easier. instructions yeah. without any decisions is helpful maybe. Is kind so of this this just reminds me of something and, and now I understand something else. So in ditch pins, which Autumn and I were facilitating along with other people in the summer, we did do Conversation Cafe in the first synchronous meeting, but there was a facilitator in every room who was one of us. Right. Right. So if you have like teaching assistants or if you have um, students who know you from before who can do that role, or if you can meet up with five students beforehand and explain the process to them and let them practice it, um, and then they become the hosts. And maybe you do that with a different group of students. It's a nice way of establishing intimacy with small groups of students too. That you know, you mm -hmm. guys are the hosts this week, so let's meet and prepare. 
and then another group for the hosts next week. That could be a cool thing to do. Um, so I was just yes. realizing that I think you, I think you were the one who suggested at the time that maybe we need a facilitator in each room to make sure that it goes smoothly. It's one of mm -hmm. those things that people who are natural facilitators will find themselves managing very well. But if you have a group of none of that and with undergrads, like yeah, it's a good point. Nice. And not about the activity, but I was thinking about me, I was talking about, about signaling that we're paying attention. And, and I've got the luxury of where I can kind of stand back and, and look at the screen differently. And, and Sarah Goldergrab had a conversation on Twitter about this and Michelle Michael Morris got involved about, you know, am I, do I need to look at the camera all the time so the students think I'm looking at me and, and yeah, Autumn kind of clued to that of you're looking over here, but Autumn's over there on my screen, right? That's, yeah. How do we you know that happens signal? when you give you know that happens when you give virtual presentations a lot of the time is that you're yeah. appearing to people in a certain way but you can't see them and it, it gets really yeah. bad but yeah the, those people who look at the camera instead of looking at the people I can understand if you're recording a video and there's no one there but I don't right. understand how I you can't. really think it's more humanizing to not look at people I don't but Is I that, think like they your do. reactions you need to react to their faces. <laughs> Right. Yeah, that's a separate issue, right? Yeah, the camera can't be in the middle of the screen. Yeah, it, it would be fun work. if they tried doing that. <laughs> or let the camera just follow your eyes. They could do that technology. But now we're running away from this topic. So I'm yes. going to wrap up the video. <laughs> Thank you all. Not that we ever do that. <laughs>